And as we're getting started, feel free to go ahead and drop in the chat uh, where you guys are joining from, what part of the country we're all from. I think we've got folks from all over the US, mostly here on the West Coast, but would love to see some of the towns folks are joining from across the country, if you're willing to share. I'm from San Francisco, by the way, so I'll put that out there. And looking out at a very gray sky, uh, it's nice to, to be cold, honestly, after the heat wave in California and fires. I see Leeds in the UK, which I love. That's awesome. And Chris is, of course, out in the would-be. And awesome. So thanks, guys. Please feel free to keep throwing those out there. Love it. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I know folks are going to be joining uh, slowly, but as you can see, a lot of folks on the West Coast, but a lot of folks from other parts of the world, Dublin, Ireland, Toronto, love it. Um, and uh, just so we have enough time for questions, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. And I'm, I'm sure there'll be folks joining for the next you know, five or 10 minutes as, as folks drop, hop off of their meetings late. Uh, Zoom to Zoom, right? So quick agenda. Uh, we should be done with the, the intro by about 12.10. I'm going to start off with some trivia. A couple questions for you guys uh, here. Uh, so, so a couple of trivia questions. And the way this works is if you could post your answer in the chat, the first person to answer the question in the chat will get a free Nginx t-shirt. Uh, Olivia, who's on the phone, will be reaching out to you guys after. And then, of course, um, one other thing to call out, um, you may get this a little bit later, maybe after lunchtime today, especially for you folks joining from other parts of the world where it's nighttime or where it's almost dinner, right? But uh, we will be sending out Uber Eats codes to all the folks that actually join today, um, and it will go out after this event. So trivia, if you answer these questions right in the chat, we'll get you guys a t-shirt, and then anybody that joins will get an Uber Eats code. Uh, and you'll see both of those coming from Olivia. So when you when you get a note from Olivia, she's doing nice things for you. <laughs> try to try to respond to her. It's it's not a, a note from a, a computer or something. All right. So what year was Nginx publicly released? And by that I mean the open source project. Who's gonna get that first? All right. Yeah. Looks like Mahesh got 2004, and we got a bunch of other folks. Quick on Google. So Mahesh Mahesh wins though. Quickest, quickest trigger. Uh, I think you're out, out of the UK. So uh, work, working well at night there. <laughs> um, beating all the Americans here at our lunch hour. All right, so who acquired Nginx? This is kind of a fun one. Yeah, all right, Ro Roman, you got it. Uh, that was kind of an easy one. Uh, but it, we got a lot of developers joining us and, and I, I, I am, you know, folks are always surprised that we were acquired and, and uh, we are now owned by F5. It's been a good home. Cool, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, congratulations, Mahesh and Roman. Um, I like that Mahesh gave that one a shot as well, and you guys all got it right. Um, and we'll we'll have some more questions for you guys next time. But uh, I'm going to make a generalization to kick us off, and uh, and then we'll get into some more specifics. There's two types of apps in this world: there's greenfield apps and there's brownfield apps. That's a little bit of an oversimplification because this is kind of more what they look like if we're being super simplistic. But uh, they're often mixed together. And this is where things start to get a little bit more complicated, right? So based on a brand survey that we did a few years ago, about 60% of apps in our customer environment, so you can think of this as, as Nginx, right? So this is Nginx pre-acquisition, um, folks that were you know, aligned with us. Uh, we had about 1,500 customers at this time. And of that, of the folks that responded, I think there were about 500 responses, 60% of their core apps uh, that are still deployed are, are, are legacy apps, so monolithic applications. About 30% were hybrid, and about 10% were true 100% microservices applications. So we're still seeing, as was a couple of years ago, and, and certainly a lot has changed in the last couple of years, but we're still seeing a, a, a tremendous amount of monolithic applications driving a lot of revenue for business. And that means that this middle area is where most enterprise customers who have some sort of technical debt are going to be for years and years to come. So whatever we do, we kind of need to think about you know, not only the greenfield applications that we're producing, but also like the brownfield and, and the stuff that we're refactoring into a microservices setting. Now, the current CNCF landscape, I, I took this this morning, I actually had to zoom out to 60% just to get the screen grab to work. Um, it's pretty crowded. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts and pieces. So I'm going to try to, to simplify this and uh, a couple times, right? So it's a lot. Uh, what do I think need to think about to start ramping towards actually getting Kubernetes into production state, right? So that's what we're going to try to get into. And this is one of the first questions that I hear folks ask, right? What flavor of Kubernetes are you going to leverage in your environment? So it's vanilla, 
Um, I always, always like that phrase. There's always vanilla Kubernetes. You can roll your own, add things to it. But there's a lot of other options as well, as you guys know. And, and it can be a pain in the butt to, to manage uh, vanilla Kubernetes and all the upgrade cycles and everything else there. So uh, there's the cloud services, right? Uh, pretty robust framework on the cloud services with AKS, EKS, GKE is very mature. Certainly have customers using all, all of the above. And they're starting to get better about like actually having something that goes into an on-prem environment, right? With Azure Stack, Outpost, and Anthos. Um, there might be a way to support these on-prem either now or in the future. Um, and so that they can support you in multiple environments. But then there's also platform agnostic vendors. And this is where things start to get really crowded on this end too. There's Rancher, which actually, as you guys might know, was just acquired by SUSE. Um, still, I'm, I'm sure that they're going to continue to do great things. We're a good partner for them. Um, Docker, which you guys may know, is actually Marantis now. Uh, Red Hat, as you guys I'm sure know, is, is part of IBM. Um, and then there's a, a bunch of other smaller players and folks that I'm forgetting, right? And most of them have either changed their name or been acquired, right? In Mesosphere's case, they changed their name and sort of their core strategy. Um, in the case of like Apprenda or PKS, uh, obviously owned by much larger companies now. So this is also a fairly complicated landscape. <laughs> if we just try to answer this simple question. And I talked to a customer earlier this week who actively is evaluating like four or five of these, right? Just to try to narrow, narrow down the scope. So how can we, you know, make this a little bit simpler. And what we're going to try to focus on today is figuring out our application routing, monitoring, and security strategy, right? So if we're looking at, at, what's, uh, at what we can focus on, right? Uh, app routing, we typically are, you know, see Nginx as the most commonly deployed ingress controller in a Kubernetes environment. And we have existing, uh, existing uh, tool for, tooling for just about all of those Kubernetes platforms that I was showing you before, right? So existing integrations, and we'll continue to upkeep those integrations and have relationships with those companies. Uh, we also have a great relationship with Grafana, right? And, and a great integration with Prometheus. And so we'll, a lot of the demos that you see us do uh, with, uh, with Ingress Controller will show an out of the box integration with Prometheus and Grafana um, so that we can get your monitoring set up across any environment that you choose. And then security. This is a new consideration, but we're gonna talk a little bit about shifting security left and, and basically adding a WAF at the ingress controller layer. And some of the reasons why you might do that, um, it's not at all a, a necessity or requirement for every company, but it is something that we're seeing more and more in particular on the West Coast, right? So if we, if we figure these things out, we build a platform agnostic tool chain, we can solve these problems one time and solve them for good, right? It doesn't matter necessarily what platform you end up choosing for Kubernetes, we will have a production ready you know, application routing, monitoring, and security strategy that, that can port to those different applications. And as you saw, um, a lot of these companies get acquired. Uh, there's been a ton of movement in that space. And so it could be that your enterprise has a great relationship with VMware. It could be that you have a great relationship with, you know, the Google team and they acquire somebody that is, was a small player and now it makes more sense to use that technology versus what you're currently using. The only constant in this space has changed. So let's try to build something that's platform agnostic and that can move around, right? That's what we're going to talk about today. So uh, in the Kubernetes environment, we're adding several more locations to deploy app services and specifically security services. And what we're going to review today is the ingress controller tier, um, where you're probably familiar with deploying a WAF. We're also going to talk a little bit about this is deploying a WAF at the edge. So why would it deploy a WAF at the ingress controller tier? We're, we're not going to talk about per service proxy or per pod proxy. We just want to call out that Nginx is lean enough that we are, I think, the most, the most commonly deployed container image about 25% of all containers out there are running Nginx in some way, shape, or form, uh, according to Sysdig. Um, and then we also you know, are the most commonly used ingress controller, right? So about 62% of all ingress implementations are, are Nginx. But we're lean enough, and the WAF that we're going to talk about today is lean enough that we can fit in, in either environment, in a container, and, and uh, in a container on a, on a Kubernetes uh, environment as well. All right. And there's three criteria to determine where to deploy this service, right? So if we think about the traditional way to deploy, right, uh, closer to the edge, we think about, you know, NetOps and SecOps personas, as all of you guys know, and as some of you guys are, are probably doing in your day to day, we're seeing DevOps and we all of us term DevSecOps <laughs> uh, take a bigger role uh, in, in the environment and use slightly different tool chains, things that are a little bit easier to automate. Um, and that's where we, we start to see security shifting left, right? It might make sense to put a blanket security policy out there for all of your applications, but now that you might have thousands of applications or thousands of APIs, that blanket security policy might not be ideal for all of those APIs or might not actually protect them the way that they need to be protected. So if we shift security left, maybe we can do per app, per service level security controls where that application needs that level of security, but maybe other applications don't, right? And that's where the benefit of, of having some of the granular policies set off to the left-hand side. 
um, if, if that fits your organization in the way that you guys are, are, are thinking about things. Um, so I'm not going to get into the specifics of this, but a couple of important notes. Um, F5 Container Ingress Service is, is basically F5's uh, Big IP's uh, ingress controller for Kubernetes. Um, obviously, we, we do have one as well. Uh, combined, I think we own about 80% of the market. F5 owns about 15% and Nginx owns about 65% of the Kubernetes market. Um, we are going to be integrating these and they're, so that it's clean to deploy. And you can have your DevOps folks and application owners own their ingress controller and the network team can seamlessly integrate with that. So we want to make sure that existing investments and things that folks have invested in at the network layer will work right in this new in this new environment, but that each tool is, is doing the things that it, it's ideal for. And with that, uh, we're going to talk about WAF on ingress and I'm going to pass things over to Chris to take over and, and get a new demo show this thing in action. Great, thank you, Adam. You see that screen okay? Yep, we see you. Okay. Um, yeah, quick introduction, uh, Chris Acker. I'm a solution architect with uh, Nginx uh, business unit, now part of uh, F5. Um, I've been with Nginx a little over two years, and I previously worked uh, at F5 for uh, about uh, about seven years. So what I have for you today is just um, a few slides just talking about high-level security stuff, nothing too intense. But then I'm going to show you um, a demo, and we are going to actually build um, an AppProtect uh, firewall on, uh, on CentOS. Uh, for the edge use case. And then we're going to do the same thing with a Kubernetes ingress controller. And uh, I'm leveraging a demo environment we have internally at F5. And uh, in a short call out to uh, Matthew Derrick, it's his uh, demo environment uh, uh, that I'm using. So appreciate uh, all of his work on that. Um, I don't think I really need to talk too much about why we need security. It seems like um, at least once a week, we hear about breaches, we hear about vulnerabilities. I think all of us have been uh, notified by a bank or some financial institution that our personal uh, information has been stolen and you can sign up for free credit, uh, you know, reporting, uh, monitoring and stuff like that. And, um, you know, the reality is, is it's just a constant challenge and a battle, if you will, between the good guys and the bad guys. Um, and web application firewalls are, are a great way to help mitigate and give you time to get your applications fixed or patched or updated or any vulnerabilities uh, addressed. Uh, with that in mind, um, AppProtect is actually F5 uh, intellectual property. It comes from a heritage of ASM. If you're familiar with F5's big IP platform, ASM is the application security manager, a web application firewall, very well um, regarded, um, has gotten lots of awards and industry recognition. And what we've done is we've taken the core of that software and we have ported it, if you will, to run on the Nginx uh, data plane. And so the marketing name of that product is AppProtect. And because it runs on Nginx, now you can run a lightweight, high performance web firewall anywhere that Nginx can run. So we're gonna talk about that uh, in detail. Um, that does give you strong application security. You're getting it from a reputable company like F5. Um, you get more than just the OWASP top 10. Um, there's extra things that are inside of that code beyond just a standard web firewall that you might get, say, from open source or something, or from a cloud provider. Um, so it's not just a, a basic firewall, it is the advanced firewall stack from, from F5. Um, again, very high performance, got lots of um, bells and whistles in addition to that. But I think one of the keys here, in addition to the seamless integration with Nginx, is how small it is and how fast it is. It is less than two meg on disk. I'm not kidding. Less than two meg on disk 
for a web firewall that is 20 times faster than any of the open source solutions that are out there. Again, using the Nginx data plane, uh, paying tribute to the speed and the performance and the flexibility and the simple uh, configuration of Nginx, that's what you also get with AppProtect. And you're gonna see that uh, during the demo. This also allows you to unlock some of these uh, CICD and pipeline optimizations. And what we mean by that is let's introduce security, security testing, policy checking, vulnerability uh, protection, validation. Let's move that closer to the application, closer to the development process, so that when there are issues that come up, you can be aware of them and address them in your CICD pipeline rather than waiting until it gets to production and oh, now the application is broke. We have a P1 priority ticket because the firewall policy in production blocked something that the development team was trying to push out for the application. It really slows down that time to market, that code to customer path when there's this big speed bump at the end of the process called the security review or the security design review or the security assessment. There's all kinds of business reasons to do this, but I would submit to you there's a better way to do it. And a lightweight app protect firewall lets you at an economical um, cost move and shift security, what we call to the left, which is further up the pipeline. And that's one of the key initiatives that we have uh, heard from customers that they would like to be able to address that. Just a little bit about the product itself and what are you getting quote out of the box. So with a subscription to app protect uh, it's identical to your subscription for nginx plus. Um, you basically get attack signatures that come with the product, but even more importantly, you get what are called threat campaign signatures. And threat campaign signatures are the ones that are specialized and they come from the security response team at F5, the same guys working on ASM. Those signatures are designed to prevent current persistent threats. So these are things that have been noticed in the internet and looks like a new attack, if you will, or a new method of trying to take advantage of an exploit. And the F5 team, the security team, they write a new signature to combat that. And they provide that to you with a subscription. It's add-on for ASM, but it, it is included with your app protect subscription. So it's not a, it's not an additional charge. And so that's the difference, if you will, between kind of a standard based attack signature set and a threat campaign signature set. And I'll show you how to install those. Because we have this lightweight firewall, as Adam mentioned, we now have some additional opportunities and locations that you could consider putting firewall technology from a, um, a, a web application perspective. Uh, I'm gonna show you the edge and I'm gonna show you the Kubernetes ingress, but you could also load this on your API uh, gateways. Um, about 40% of all API gateways are running Nginx under the hood, whether you're on-prem or in the cloud. Um, if you have a specialized firewall requirement, you could actually run this in a pod. Um, I'm not going to demo that for you today, but we do have demos available for that um, running app protect in a Docker container. Um, very again, it's two meg on disk, so it's very lightweight. So it is very practical and possible now to run a, a state of the art web firewall, very high performance with a small footprint in a container or a pod if you need to. And then um, last but not least, you could also decide to deploy a specialized 
proxy with firewall to protect a particular microservice or something that uh, you want to be able to protect. And this is kind of the recap slide that uh, Adam mentioned. We do now have uh, additional locations for where you could do this, especially in Kubernetes. And back to the CI CD pipeline comment, um, we've tried to make it as simple and as easy as possible to add these policy definitions. So once you decide to do application firewall further up in the pipeline as part of your functional testing or security testing, um, you can um, simply change these policies. And I will also submit to you that these policies can be different for different apps and for different teams and apply the appropriate level of security um, depending on what that application is actually going to be responsible for. If it has financial information or um, HR information or HIPAA information, you may have a tighter and more restrictive policy, but you don't need that for uh, other components of the application. So it allows you to surgically apply web firewall technology where it makes the most amount of sense and you get to determine how granular or how broad those security policies are. So with that, I'm gonna transition now over into the demo environment. And um, I'm just gonna give you a quick overview of what the demo environment looks like. And I'm gonna show you how to install and run Nginx um, App Protect on both a standalone uh, CentOS server and also with a Kubernetes ingress controller. So I call this my 357 demo. It takes three commands to install it, five lines of configuration to, to turn it on in Nginx. And I guarantee you we'll have this running in seven minutes or less. So that's my 357 demo. A little bit about the, the architecture itself. It's very simple. I just have a CentOS server. We're gonna load App Protect on that. And I have um, a Kubernetes three node cluster in this lab environment. And I have four different pods that make up the main uh, web application. It's a financial services application. I'll show you the UI for that in a minute. Um, it has uh, a couple of apps and a back end. And then uh, off to the side, we have a ELK server. Um, that's the Elasticsearch and Kaibana. So this is where we're gonna see some of the logging events and some of the things that um, are presented from uh, the firewall itself from App Protect. So again, pretty simple in a short amount of time that seems to be uh, about right. So here's your three install commands that you need to do in order to install App Protect. I will highlight that we are using whatever package manager system comes with the native distro of Linux that you're using. So in my case with CentOS and Red Hat and Oracle, that would be yum. If this was on Ubuntu, you would see these apt get commands, which would be very similar. But in essence, we're gonna install app protect. We're gonna install the latest signature set. And then we're also gonna install threat campaign signatures on top of that. The prerequisites for this are the same as Nginx plus. You need to have your SSL certificate and key to access the repo. And then there is an additional repo that you would have to create in order to get the app protect signatures. So uh, again, three install commands and a couple of Linux commands to set up the repo and, and you're good to go. Okay. Five, those are the five commands that you need to get this thing to work in Nginx. The first line is actually loading the app protect software with the load module command. So this is actually loading the firewall software into memory for Nginx to use. And then you need four commands in a server block or a location block to turn it on. So the first line you enable it. The second line, you tell what policy you want to use. And again, policy definitions are completely up to you. 
we're obviously just going to use the default. Then you have to enable logging. And if you enable logging, you need to tell it where to send the logs. In this case, we're going to do a syslog server, which is going to send it over to the Kaibana server. So there's the five commands you need to get it going. And then you restart Nginx and we'll go do a couple of verification checks. And then we're going to try just a couple of, uh, you know, URLs to see once if the firewall is actually working. I'm actually going to take some additional time beyond seven minutes because I'm going to show you what this looks like before app protect and what this looks like after we enable the web firewall. And then we're going to do the exact same thing for Kubernetes. And believe it or not, you also need only five lines of configuration data in your Kubernetes configuration files to run app protect. And I'll show you those in detail in the demo. But you can see here, we turn it on, we define a policy, we turn on logging, and we give it a syslog server destination, which is the same syslog server, by the way. It's the same Kaibana server. So with that, I'm gonna I'm gonna transition over to the the demo environment. So this is my CentOS server. And I will show you my existing Nginx config file, which is the default, by the way. And so if I just do a quick curl command to localhost, you're going to recognize that this is just the thank you for using Nginx server. And real quickly, if you were in a browser, this is how I have this set up. That's just the welcome Nginx page. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to configure Nginx as a proxy in front of this Arcadia financial application. So I already have this configured to make it easy so you don't have to sit through multiple versions of uh, VI editing. So I'm going to overwrite my Nginx conf with an Arcadia one. I'm going to test my Nginx config, see if it's good. And I'm going to tell Nginx to reload the new config. And now we're going to try that same curl command. And now I get a web page for Arcadia Finance. What does that actually look like? Let's try it. So this is my sample financial application called Arcadia Finance. And as you can see, it's got some, it's got some functions in here. So in this case, you can uh, look at your credit card balance. You can do some stock trades. You can transfer some money. This is just a sample uh, training application that we use for So now what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to run a cross-site scripting attack. You notice in this URL, I told it that I want to run this script. And you'll notice that there's no protection here. This, this web service is, is responding with a cross-site scripting attack. Let's try that on the curl command and see what that looks like. Okay, so I've done two cross-site scripting requests and this application server, this web page just says, no problem, here you go. You can have whatever you want. Uh, if I had time, I could try three or four other types of uh, HTTP attacks. I'm just trying uh, cross-site scripting. So now we wanna protect this application So 
So now I'm going to install app protect. So I said there was three commands. Here they are. I'm going to install app protect. It's going to download a few dependencies from the internet. Okay, it says it was successfully installed. I'll just point out a couple things here. This is the version number. So if you're looking to verify what version you're running, it's 3.9. And I told you this would fit inside of a container. Would you believe me if I had told you ahead of time that the size of this binary is only 172 K bytes? Probably not. So now let's uh, download the signatures. So it's going to go up to the repo. I've previously defined the repo for yum. It's installing the signatures. I need the Jeopardy. I, I, I need the Jeopardy time clock. Okay. Now the signatures. Here's the version number 826 2020. What is today's date? Today's the 27th. So these signatures were literally updated yesterday, if you believe this timestamp. And they are 1.3 meg in size. So now you have a web firewall with 172K and a signature set of 1.3 meg. So you're currently at 1.5 meg now for a firewall. And let's add threat campaigns to this. Okay, so now we have threat campaigns. Timestamp is from 824, so a few days ago. And the install size of the threat campaigns is 113K. So for 1.6 meg on disk, you now have a state-of-the-art web firewall with attack signatures and threat campaign signatures installed and running. Okay. So now we need to tell our Nginx server that we want to use this stuff, right? So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to show you the original configuration file for Arcadia. And you'll notice that I have commented out the load module command. And I also have commented out the four commands you need to turn it on, All right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna copy over top of that. The app protect default file is now going to become my new nginx config file. So now, if I look at my nginx config file, if I could type, you'll see that the comment is missing from load command and the comments are missing from that. So now all I need to do is restart nginx. But first, I'm going to test my config. See if it's valid, and it is. So now I'm going to reload Nginx. This will take a little bit faster, or I'm sorry, it'll take a little bit more time um, to do a reload in general because you are initializing a module and you are reading the policy definition file and the syslog definition. You know, so you're setting up a few things, but it's pretty, it's pretty fast. Okay, so. Let's go back and 
yeah, I'm still seeing my service. So what happens now if I try the cross-site scripting attack? Anybody want to bet? You notice that I get a reject message now immediately from Nginx that says this object was rejected or this request was rejected. And you'll notice on the far right over here, let me zoom in just one here, this support ID number. So if you're familiar with ASM, Big IP's firewall, whenever there's a rejection, right, there is also a support ID, it's the same support ID. The support ID numbers are um, very similar to what you'd see in ASM. They are a 64-bit random number um, assigned to each uh, rejection or each request. And if you're familiar with Nginx Plus's request ID, that is also a 64-bit random number generated to track every request. And this is important because if you're trying to work on security policies and it's breaking things, you want to know very clearly which request was broken and why. And so this is why the support ID is so important. So let's go take a look at that on the browser, see what the user experience would be. So if we go back to this page and I hit refresh a couple of times, it's working as expected. But now I try to launch that same URL with the cross-site scripting attack in it and I got a very similar rejection message in the browser. And again, it's highlighting, right, what that support ID is. So now it's time to show you what that looks like in Kaibana. So as you're probably aware, Kaibana is kind of an open source event management tracking graphing system. And the Nginx App Protect team has graciously provided us some built in or what we call default dashboards. So you don't have to build them all yourself. And they look like this. And what you'll see here is that, yep, there's been a couple of requests that have been blocked and they've been sent over to Kaibana and added to the logging engine. And now we can visualize them. And you see here the kind of info you would expect on a web firewall management console, like where the attacks came from, what signatures were violated, what kind of distribution did you have for the types of attacks. Um, unfortunately, the GOIP map does not work uh, in a lab environment with, with addresses. But I'll just point out that here is a error message. Expand this to full screen so you can see it. And so this is the, the syslog data that came from the firewall. And it tells me all about the attack. It tells me it was a cross-site scripting attack. It gives me the URL that was actually typed, right? It tells me what policy was triggered for the denial and that it was rejected. And it categorizes it for you as you would expect with the cross-site scripting parameter as being uh, not approved. And importantly, here's that support ID number that we talked about. So support ID number ends in 327. So let's go look and see. Is that the same one that I saw down here? Oh, by golly, it is. There's 327. Sorry, it's off the screen just a bit. So this support ID ended up in the logging engine exactly as you would expect. And then, of course, there's some additional metadata down here as well. It tells you like what the virtual server was and things like that. Let's see if I can find another one. Let's 
So it's the same one. Yeah, that's the same one. So that's pretty much the end of the demo for the setting up app protect on CentOS. So just to recap, it's a 357 demo, three commands to install it, five lines to edit in your Nginx config to enable it, and it's up and running in less than seven minutes. So now you have a firewall in front of your environment. So now what we're going to do is we're going to do the same thing, but we're going to do this on Kubernetes. So let me go back to my architecture slide. So we just did this one up here, the app protect CentOS on the edge in front of this Kubernetes application that's running. Now we're going to take the ingress controller and we're going to do the same thing. So I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to show you what it looks like before and then after we add app protect. Bring the screen over here again. So this is the application in Kubernetes and you'll notice up here in the address bar, the host name is different. Now I am going directly to the application using uh, the ingress controller on a node port. So I'm not going through the CentOS server at all. I'm going directly to the Kubernetes ingress and uh, same thing should apply. We should be able to log in and see what's going on on this application. And if I try a cross-site scripting like I have on the other side, because I'm going direct, I'm now going around the CentOS firewall. Uh, you see that there's no protection here for this cross-site scripting request. It's going through um, on its own. So let's fix that. Let's add an ingress controller. Well, before I do that, let me show you what it looks like from a Kubernetes perspective. So this is the Kubernetes dashboard, if you will, that is running in this environment. And there's a bunch of stuff in here. So first I'll switch to the application itself. So it's in the default namespace. Here's my four pods, the main app two, three, and the back end. And there's their names and they're, they're up and running. The next thing I'll show you is the Nginx plus ingress controller. So this is what is routing the, the request. So this definition, let's go look at the pod here. And this is the ingress controller itself. And I'm just gonna point out a couple of things. The first one is, is that this is running version 1.6.3. So this was built using an older version of Kubernetes ingress controller that does not support app protect. You need version 1.8 or higher in order to be able to run app protect inside the ingress controller. And the last thing I'll show you is the, um, the ingress controller definition, actually the service definition. So I've named this Arcadia ingress. And this is what does the routing, if you will, to the different pods. And you'll see here a whole bunch of information about how it routes the traffic. But I just want to show you here that we have a service called main, a service called backend, a service called app two and three. 
which map one-to-one -to, -one to those pods that I showed you. So now we're gonna tell Kubernetes we wanna run a new version of Nginx ingress controller, and we're gonna enable app protect at the same time. So in order to do that, we gotta to go to kubectl and ask it to do some things. So first what I'll do is I'll just show you from the command line, these are the pods that are running in the environment. These first four are my application pods, like I mentioned. And here is the Nginx ingress controller that's running version 1.63. So the first thing we're gonna do is I'm gonna remove I'm going to remove the existing definition for all of this stuff. And the best way to do that is to tell Kubernetes to blow the whole thing away. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to blow away the definition for Arcadia ingress by telling it to delete the entire thing. And if I do that and bring back the Kubernetes dashboard, what you'll see is that the ingress is now gone, nothing to display. And so there's no way for traffic to get in and out of that. And if I go try to do anything with this Arcadia app, it says the site cannot be reached. So I've I've deleted the entire thing. Mind you, I haven't deleted the pods. The pods are still running. I've just deleted the ingress, which gives you access to those pods. So now I'm gonna say, okay, I want a new ingress controller and I want NAP enabled. So I have a new ingress controller definition here that says, upgrade my ingress controller to version 1.8 and enable app protect. That was pretty simple, one command. I've upgraded the whole thing. So now what does Kubernetes show me? So now let's hit refresh here, make sure this is what I'm looking for. Looks 22 seconds old, so that looks correct. Let's look at the definition of this ingress controller. And now you see the five new lines that I told you were gonna be needed, right? In order to, in order to see that AppProtect is running in this ingress controller, okay? Let's look at the ingress controller itself. I told you that we are gonna upgrade it. Let's see if I'm right. Here's the new ingress controller. Let's scroll down a bit and see what it says here. Two things to point out. It is running version 1.8. And you notice on the arguments when it starts, I'm going to enable app protect. So now I've told it to update the version. It's pulled a new image. It's running the new ingress controller software and I've told it to turn on app protect. So that's important because the ingress controller is where the firewall software is actually going to run. Okay. So let's try this again. So this is now working. Let's see what happens when I try this cross-site scripting attack again. What do you think? Is it gonna block it? Okay, looks like it blocked it. There's my new support ID number, 081. 
Let's see once if Kaibana's picked that up yet. Got a couple of blips there. Let's go take a look. This one here got blocked. It's probably this last one. So now we're going to drill down into this request violation. Log source. So this is where the event came from. Does that match the ingress controller that I just told you that was started? Looks like the same ingress controller to me. There's the security policy that was triggered called data guard blocking. Same thing, cross-site scripting. Here's your support ID number, 081. Does that match? 081, that matches. So I'm looking at the right event. Okay, I think we are done with that portion of the demo. So just a few slides to wrap up. In summary, I showed you the 357 demo, three install commands, five, com five configuration commands, seven minutes or less, you can be running Nginx on a standalone CentOS server. Very similar speed, if you will, with the Kubernetes ingress controller in that once you have your uh, Kubernetes files defined, it's pretty easy to enable Nginx app protect in, in the Kubernetes environment. We also get questions from customers about what size, how big is it? How fast is it? What kind of resources does it consume? To recap, the app protect was 172K on disk. The signature file was 1.3 meg on disk. The threat campaign repo was 113K for a grand total of about 1.6 meg on disk. You can almost run this from a floppy drive, very similar to running Nginx from a floppy. And what about performance? So as you're probably well aware, open source software and free packages sometimes don't perform as well as you would like. And so this is some test results from internal testing with the App Protect team. Um, and I'm, I'm very pleased to say that it has significant performance improvements over uh, open source solutions by a factor of almost 20. Um, and you get the extra protections, like I said, above and beyond the OWASP top 10. Um, and the latency is phenomenal, um, as in it doesn't add any more latency to, to the request being processed. So you really do have access now to the best of both worlds, lightweight, fast Nginx data plane with a lightweight, fast firewall from F5 and the App Protect and ASM security teams. So very excited about this, and I'm sure I'm sure customers will be as well. Uh, just in summary, um, we'll send this out after the webinar, obviously. But these are links to the product pages, the threat campaign, the signatures the ingress controller. Um, some of these things can be demo. There's actually an app protect demo um, that is available on GitHub. So you can see that if you want to play with that for yourself. Um, and when we talked about CI CD pipeline, um, we also have um, some resources for you, like an Ansible uh, uh, playbook, um, an Ansible role for you uh, if you're using Ansible in your, in your CI CD pipeline. So with that, I'll just say thank you again for your time and your attention. I appreciate um, you taking the time away from your lunch to come join us. And um, we will be around for uh, questions and follow up for uh, the next few minutes. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Adam.
Yeah, definitely. Yeah, please feel free, guys, to, to either continue to enter questions in the chat. Really appreciate you guys keeping us engaged. We will share slides. So I just saw that come come through from Castutis. Uh, hey, how's it going? Um, we will share slides, uh, and and you guys you guys will have all these links. That's part of why we were cool to to rush through some of the some of the slides. We wanted them to be available for reference, but uh, not necessarily important to to go through them uh, in detail. And and you guys can click the links in there as well. So, with that said, feel free to come off mute, ask questions live. We might have folks jumping over each other, uh, but feel free to to do that or or ask them in the chat, whatever you're most comfortable with, and we'll address we'll address one by one. All right, I think we have a question here from Mahesh. I'll let, uh, and we do have another SE on just to make sure in case you need to come off mute there, Jason. We've got Chris Acker, who just did the presentation, and we've got Jason Williams as well. So it could be one of these two guys answering some of these questions in case Jason jumps in. So any thoughts on that, Chris and Jason? Sorry, I have a quick question. Yeah, please. May I? Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, so. Some of uh, large utility customers um, follow a national energy regulation uh, standard called, uh, actually in North America, it's called NERC SIP, and, it, and it's very intensive cybersecurity compliance that almost forces them to run in an air-gapped mode. And the question that I have is, I know I can run Kubernetes air-gapped, but I would have to, you know, kind of port sneaker net, you know, service pack updates and that to it as needed, uh, right? Because it doesn't have internet access. That's what the air gap is, right? How about for your signature updates? Is there a similar process that a customer can follow in an air gapped environment, like, you know, once a week, maybe getting the latest signatures and loading them? Uh, yeah, great question. Thank you. Um, yeah, we get that um, question quite a bit, just not only for App Protect, but for other nginx binaries as well and that is one of the reasons that the app protect team decided to use the package management platform on the distro because most customers already have some kind of method to uh, bring those packages in from outside vet them you know do whatever they need to do and then make them available on a private repo inside the air gapped environment. And so whatever that process is that they use for Linux distros, right? Whatever it is that they are running, uh, the same method and the same process would apply to either updating the binaries or updating the signature sets. That's why we went with the yum route for CentOS and APT get for Ubuntu and other distros um, of that flavor. Um, so it shouldn't be any different. You are just adding, quote, some new packages to whatever that vetting process is before you make them available internally. Perfect. Thank you very much. Great question. Awesome. And then Chris and, and Jason, we do have a question from Mahesh. I'll just read it, read it out to you guys. Uh, do we have HPA support for Nginx ingress controller based on the number of requests? Let's see if you guys have a follow on to that. I'll have to admit, I'm not sure what you mean by HPA support. That is not a term I have seen before with Nginx ingress. So you'll have to clarify what you mean by HPA, please. It could also be possible. Mahesh, if you're on, feel free to, to jump in. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, I know we're at time, so we can get into that. Yeah. Uh, hi. So HP is horizontal pod autoscaler. So based on number of threads or number of requests, we can actually increase the number of pods to serve the request. So is that possible or is it supported? So Nginx Plus itself does have dynamic configuration because it's connected directly to the Kubernetes API server. So if you are scaling the number of pods up and down or launching new services and adding new quote routes or paths to Nginx Ingress, yes, that is all dynamically done. 
but nginx itself does not have any built-in uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning to tell it when to auto scale that is a command that it uh, can receive and process but it doesn't do it autonomously And then I, I see a question from Oleg that I'll, I'll actually take as the sales guy, which is uncommon, um, which is how is Nginx Plus licensed and what are the list prices? I'm going to give you a very salesy answer, unfortunately, which is, uh, for, so two things. One is we built Nginx Plus pricing more around like a lot of the initial customers that we had, right? So you think somebody that is rolling us out as a load balancer is an API gateway across maybe three or four regions, maybe you need two to three instances per region. Our pricing model scales really well in that setting where it, it can break sometimes and where we're very sensitive to the fact that we, we might have to do something a little bit more custom is in a container environment, right? And, and I can tell you, like, I have a customer in production who's scaled up and can run 50,000 instances of our software. And we're really built to, you know, sell in the 20 to three or 400 range, right? So you can imagine that's a custom thing we had to kind of work through with them. Um, so I, I don't have a, an exact answer for you um, other than we've done this before. We've had to get into container pricing. We know that some of these environments are kind of hairy and complex. Uh, we've taken a lot of folks to production in, in uh, Kubernetes uh, with very, very different architectures and requirements. And we'll do what we can to make, make licensing uh, aligned to whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish uh, because we know that you need flexibility in this environment both, to, both, both before like as we're working on a contract and after, right? As you're, as you're needing to scale up and down and be a little bit more dynamic. So that's something we're sensitive to and we've had experience with. Uh, so apologies for the non-answer, but that's the, the best we can do on this call. Um, happy to, to chat one-to-one -one, uh, afterwards uh, or put you in contact with the right folks uh, if needed. Any other questions, guys? And we're, we're, here, we're here to stay for a little bit longer. We, we had our time blocked. I know that some folks probably have to run to another, another Zoom call, <laughs> but feel free to jump in. I just want to say I really enjoyed the presentation and I thought that 357 was very unique <laughs> and it caught it kept our, it kept my attention anyway so thank you very much I'm gonna go thanks much Steve uh, last call out guys uh, feel free to send us an email oh, go ahead you see this I see you there. Uh, hello I just uh, I just want uh, to say the same it was a great presentation very very neat and, and very clear and also covers uh, things like uh, our needs uh, we're running in air gap environment. We 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 trying to. I'm working with Chris, by the way, so as well. So he aware of our requirements. My question is this: If you decide to push new signatures, um, would we need to um, reload nginx uh, each time, or this will be addressed dynamically? Let's say. Um, Currently, it does require a reload. Because reload. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, it has to reread the signature file that the signature file, as you can imagine, is a mm -hmm. I think JSON formatted, basically a text file with all of these parameters in it. And when you talk about the threat campaigns, those are highly targeted, very mm -hmm. narrow, specific rules looking for very detailed things. And so those have to be defined in the threat campaign file. And in order for those to be running in memory, you have to uh, you have to do mm -hmm. the Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, please feel free to keep jumping in with questions. I see we still have a, a number of people on the line. Um, so thanks for staying with us for a little extra time. I'm just going to call out. We do have a free developer conference we're hosting virtually in just under a month, guys. So please feel free to to sign up. We'll, this will also be on the slide deck that we send out, so you don't have to memorize it now, but you can go to the, go to the website now if you so choose. Uh, but we, we've got Sprint coming up uh, where we're going to be talking about uh, things like Nginx Service Mesh, which I called out in the chat, uh, and, and a number of other solutions that we're bringing to market, uh, along with a lot more content on AppProtect in, in this use case, um, and just a, a little bit on what we'll be showing. But uh, another great way to engage while we're all stuck at home uh, and learn about some stuff if this is all relevant to you guys. Um, and then we should be we should be hosting more events like this after Sprint. We're going to let our, our marketing and events team wind down, but sometime in October, November timeframe, we should be trying to do, do a little bit more. And uh, speaking to Nginx Service Mesh, yeah, I, I can speak at a high level, and, and maybe Chris, if you want to drill down, 
Um, it, it basically, it, I think that the fair question is like, why build another service mesh? There's a million of these things out there, right? You got some, some good tools from console when hash or hashy and console connect. We've got Kuma from Kong. We've got, you know, Linkerd, uh, and then obviously Istio and a bunch of different flavors of Istio right now to, to, to roll under. Um, what we found kind of across the board and, and there's some interesting things about console connect and, and Kuma. But in practice, we found that very few of our customers um, and, and users, for that matter, actually got Istio into a production working state. Um, and that's because it, it solves a lot of problems, but it, it, you know, it's also very complex. And we've seen it create additional problems that customers weren't really expecting. Um, and also introduce a significant amount of overhead, both in latency and, uh, and in compute. Um, anecdotally, I had a customer tell me that Istio uh, we ended up rolling them out under under nginx ingress across a couple of regions in gke but their istio deployment one application granted big application uh, max max load was i think 120,000 ssl uh, transactions per second so that's what they were scaling to uh, their istio the, the bill from the cloud provider for the compute required to run just the istio bits and bytes right so just istio software packages was like two to three hundred grand a year Right, so there was a significant overhead on compute usage that they were concerned about, along with latency and, and sorting through some of that. So we think Istio is a great platform. We just don't know that it's ideal for uh, mass market and a lot of use cases. So what we did with Nginx Service Mesh is we tried to bring uh, a Nginx is a pretty flexible proxy. So we wanted a service mesh that was very focused on the data plane. Um, Envoy is a great project, but it's not actually owned by any of those platforms that are being built around it. Right, like the Istio team and the Envoy team coordinate but a lot of these other tools that are built on Envoy are not actually being run by the Envoy engineering team. That's, we can say something a little bit different. We can actually build a service mesh that's geared towards a proxy under the hood, right, in Nginx Plus. And then at the same time, um, we feel like Istio is pretty heavy, and so we wanted to build something that was lighter weight, so easier to spin up, easier to get started, and, uh, and, and something that, that folks can roll out quickly, right? Um, but with that said, Istio can do a lot of cool stuff, and we're not gonna just try to replicate that, we wanted to, to actually differentiate, and those are some of the, the ways we're thinking that we can differentiate. Um, but that, again, is something we're releasing next month. Uh, Ingress is very mature. It's been around for a long time. Service Mesh will be new in September. We'll be talking about it more at Sprint if you want to see more. Uh, Chris, did you want to add anything to that or, or tweak anything, man? Um, well, I guess I could give you a little bit of a teaser in the sense that, as you can imagine, the ingress controller is the tip of the iceberg on what Nginx is going to be, Nginx and F5 are going to be doing for Kubernetes environments, you know, going forward. So I think it's pretty obvious that in order to be a player in this space, you got to have a rock solid high performance ingress controller, which we now have. And we're continuing to add features and functions, you know, to that platform. But that's also the stepping stone, if you will, for managing east-west traffic inside of a cluster, pod to pod, service to service, however you want to describe it. Um, and we are actively working on that. And you will see some stuff, uh, quote, later this year. That's all I'm allowed to say. But in general, um, it is a very active area of development at uh, Nginx and um, we will be probably showing you some previews of some of that software later this fall when we have Nginx Conf. Um, that's usually when we kind of do some new product announcements and some, some release announcements and things like that. So, um, and to Adam's point, um, we're not gonna make the same mistakes that the competitors have with complexity or difficulty or latency or any of those other things. You will end up with a product in a service mesh that is as fast and furious as Nginx is, uh, just like I showed you today for App Protect. So if you need something right away, go for it. If you're not really sure or you're in evaluation mode, um, I would encourage you to, uh, you know, wait and see what we bring to the table because I think you'll be impressed. Awesome, guys. Uh, feel free to shoot us more questions over via email, and uh, let's let's all keep in touch. We'll we'll continue to invite folks to our uh, to our presentations in the coming months, and we'd love to see you at Sprint in uh, about three weeks. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy your Labor Days. Well, thank you.